I have to apologize. I am an optimist. <laughs> if I were not an optimist, I don't think I could do what I've been doing as a trade working here in Umeå or working with FOI. Now I take you back to 2013. It's morning, it's like six o'clock in the morning. I'm waking up on the 13th floor in, in a luxury hotel in Damascus. You hear the small ta 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 You hear the poof. Um, one each 15 minutes or so, sometimes too close, but most of the time a bit away. When I'm out on a mission like that, I, I normally is quite strict with myself, with alcohol, with training, practicing and whatever to sort of function optimally. So I do my <coughs> workout program every morning. Doing that, I, I turn on the television. This morning, the 21st of August, there is a massive information flow of chemical weapons being used in Damascus the night while I was sleeping in Damascus. Three, four kilometers away, to my east and like five, seven kilometers away to my west. There were areas that were liberated by the liberation movement and after that had been seized and occupied, so that the circumference was occupied by the, by the Syrian government. And these areas had now been gassed during the morning hours. <laughs> On television you could see dreadful scenes of people being suffocated. And there were reports on anything between 600 killed and 1,400 people being killed, even up to like 2,000, and like 5,000 people being hurt by this. Why was I there? I'm a weapons inspector by training. I'm fostered here in Umeå, and Umeå regularly have that task to look after and, and be participating in, in peace work in, in the world. So my talk is partly to promote the actions of, of FOI here in Umeå, and I will come back to that. <coughs> Sorry. This is a report that came to the news 19 of March the same year. It's like in, in, in any dreadful conflict, particularly domestic war is very dreadful. It's brothers fighting against brothers, cousins against cousins, it's families against families. And the other side is always a traitor. And it's a grim war going on. All methods are, are allowed. You kill people at hospital, you rape women, you do whatever to win this war. And particularly if it's ethnically grounded the war, it becomes even worse, as you have seen now being developed by IS. This news came out <coughs> that Syria has been using its chemical weapons. And the interesting part about that is that Obama, the fall before in November, had spelled out that if Syria is using chemical weapons against their own citizens, then it's a game changer. Then I will rethink and US will enter into the war on the side of the li liberation movements or the rebels or whatever you want to call them the free army. So when this happens, Syria is very, very nervous. Syria calls to Ban Ki-moon and asks Ban Ki-moon, please, could you send an investigation team and clear us from this? Could you send an investigation team and look into this and say that this is not us? So Saturday night, two days after, I was called from the office of the Secretary General and asked, are you prepared to take a mission to Syria and, and look into this matter? The task would not be to judge which side was the guilty one. The task would be to see if international law has been broken and if they had committed this crime, someone has committed a crime of using chemical weapons at all and particularly against civilian, which is another crime. It's a crime against humanity. So there could be two international crimes being committed here. And I was asked then, would you lead an investigation team there? And you know, as males are, they never consider what they are saying yes to. I immediately said yes. Um, I, I have some experience of this and I consider that this would take like two or three weeks and I will be back again. When I put down the receiver, my wife looked at me and she said, what have you said yes to now? 
And I explained to her, yeah, I've been gone two or three weeks, we prepare a week or two, and then we go into the country a week, and then we go out to the country again, write the report, and that's it. I was gone almost for a full year to, to do this investigation. The, uh, this is really so by the end of the story, but I like this picture. I was working with something, an instrument called the Secretary General's Mechanism. That is a, an obligation that the Secretary General has to investigate claims like that. If a member state comes to him and say, please, can you investigate this? He has to do it. So that's why he's sending me out, and it's the General Assembly, i.e. the member states, that has given him the rights to do this. This is by the end, I just delivered my final report, and I like this picture because he mislaid the report. So we had to look around in his office to find the report after I had delivered it to him. And to me, it describes the, the chaos that all this mission was surrounded by. It was a constant improvisation in, in, in all of this. Okay, I said yes, and on that day, I am in Damascus. I am sleeping in, in the luxury hotel, uh, Four Seasons, and this is a day at work in Damascus, uh, guarded by people you never know who they are. They are not in uniform, but they have heavy weapons, and, and you, you hope you can trust them. Um, it's, it's quite a, a strange work to do. I mean, you are threatened constantly. Sometimes we were shot at, and um, there's a lot at stake because the whole world, after this attack, the 21st of August, waited for US, France, and England to enter into the war. The, the uh, Tomahawks were ready to go, the bombers were ready to go, and, and the fighters were ready to go. And they didn't like us to be there, because we were an obstacle. So it was just to hang on, try to do the work, and be aware of, you know, if you see this in the morning, if Obama sees this in the morning and his staff and the US public see this in the morning, that day and the following day, they are very motivated in going into war. Five days later, they will not be as motivated to go into war. So the strategy for us was to hang on for five days at least in the country and be an obstacle for this. Um, and following the five, six days, the country sort of turned into slower pace and decided not to go into war, as you, as you may remember. Um, it's a very tricky environment, of course, to work in. You are constantly under pressure. And you have to use the technologies that you just heard bad things about. Every day you have to build your ego up and tell yourself you will succeed also today, but to be the strong one. You end the day, you regress down to the small boy, Åke, and you're really tired and, and feel awful. Next day you have to be, you know, the grand man again and, and try to fight the Syrian governments or the rebels or whoever you are negotiating with and, and putting in, in strange conditions. This is now a video. The following report contains some disturbing images. It There's explains been a bit more time to exactly what's happening. The amateur video footage of these alleged chemical attacks in Syria and look more closely at what it can tell us. Still, many questions need answering, but a slightly clearer picture is beginning to emerge to help us understand what may have happened in the small hours of Wednesday morning in the suburbs of Damascus. The first thing we're clearer about is the likely timeline. The narrator in this video tells us these vehicles rushing from bombarded areas are makeshift ambulances and it was pitch black the middle of the night. Don't look too much at this. Um, you will see a very green picture, you've probably seen them before, and I don't want to show them to you at, at this time. They are sort of pornographic almost in, in, in the nature that it's uh, young kids dying, it's adult people dying and, and missing their breath and whatever. So it's horrible, uh, and uh, you don't need to see them. You can imagine it, and it's fine. Um, these were occupied areas. Uh, this happened morning the 21st. Um, the Undersecretary Angela Kane, who is head, heading the Department of Disarmament Affairs, and myself, were, were granted to sit down and negotiate with the Vice President or the Foreign Ministry of Syria uh, to be able to access the areas. 
And following two days of negotiations, we finally got agreement that we could access. They would have ceasefire, they would hold on shooting at us, and they would allow us five, day, five hours, four days in a row, access to this area. So we could go in, talk to people, do sampling, do the, the um, symptoms and whatever. There were 13 inspectors together me, with me there. I was teaming. One of them, unfortunately, only one of them, woman. We need more female weapons inspectors. Um, all together with drivers, interpreters, uh, security and whatever. It's totally a group of like 40 people that I was heading in Damascus. Um, we were taking big risks. This was a very high risk mission. Uh, only the Secretary General could decide on such a high risk mission. I was advised by my friends that don't take it on, okay. Uh, I don't know, I did anyhow. It worked out fine. Uh, we were lucky. We were shot at at the first entrance into the area. Uh, we had to negotiate the night before on Skype with the rebel leaders. And in the areas, it's not a unified rebel leader. There are several groups. And some of them didn't want us there, some of them wanted us there. So we had to define sort of the strongest little rebel leader, talk to them and ask them to keep the other at peace. So <coughs> there was no shouting at us and no shouting at the same time at the government, because if they shot at the government, the government would start shooting back and we would be just in the middle of the war again. Uh, on our first entry, which was on the 26th, we were r actually shot at, had some problems, renegotiated, and went in again. And finally, everything turned out okay, although we were constantly threatened, constantly fooled, uh, overheard, and constantly had uh, diplomats and the intelligence working with us. Um, I'm telling this because I think this is an example of what's happening everywhere. You have the same thing going on in Ukraine. You have the conflict, you have the intelligence, you have the diplomacy, you have the journals. And everything has an agenda. If there is a geopolitical or an ethnopolitical agenda, they will adhere to that, and whatever you see will be tinted by that agenda. So whenever we see news, and I saw the news from this, I was doing things that I had never done, I was visiting countries that I had never visited, and, and whatever. And I had an agenda that I never <laughs> adhered to. So whenever you see news from a place like that, that is of geopolitical interest, be aware that you have to read both sides. You have to read news from both sides, otherwise you're off. It's true for Ukraine, it's true for any of these major conflicts. So, by the end, was it was a big risk. What is, was it worth it? I think so. Everything went fine. The, the Secretary General was very happy with the report and, and also the um, General Assembly and, and the Security Council, w Council was happy with the, our reporting. The investigation was made to full stop. Weapons after that was removed. All chemical weapons was removed from Syria after that, following that. Um, the, the people that removed the weapons from Syria got the Nobel Prize. 2013. I didn't get it. A lot of people thought I got the Nobel Prize, but I bought a small bottle of champagne and had it with the pea soup on, on Thursday. Um, <coughs> we put back respect for international law, which is very important. If we have international law that sort of controls dis disarmament, it's also important that we have respect for these laws. I thought in the beginning, like half a year after, that actually maybe we have an opening in the conflict also as a consequence of this. I'm not so sure anymore. My last slide, who was the guilty party? We really don't know, I'm sad for that. We really should have the proof. Someone has been killing people very purposefully. But this map shows you how complicated it is. And this is not a true picture. You should also add the IS element here. So it's not just a, a West-East, the formal West-East conflict. You also have the Sunni-Shia conflict. And you have quite new partners. On the right you have Russia, Iran and Hezbollah. And on the left side you have the Sunni side. And from the Sunni side you now have the IS. I am the one, probably only one, to say sometimes that maybe the, the existence of IS is the beginning of something good. If IS could turn reasonable and respectful, IS could be the start of a good sunny area that, that actually 
uh, would satisfy the, the Sunni requirements. Because Sunnis are in minority in Iraq, Sunnis have problems in Syria because you have Assad there. So maybe a new Sunni country would be the solution to get something stable five, ten years, twenty years from now, whatever. But maybe it is the start of something good. The last word told to me was by the Deputy Secretary General. When we had a meeting, Secretary General, Deputy Secretary General and myself. And the Deputy Secretary General is a Swede, John Eliasson, and he told me, Åke, now go home and get some other people interested in working in international affairs. So, <coughs> opposite to what I said here, that you should stay in Umeå and work in Umeå, I want people from Sweden, which are doing very, very well, I think. Normally we are doing very, very well. We are very respected in international work. Be, become interested. Be out there with an NGO. Inv get involved with the UN or whatever. And fight whatever you are interested in. Poverty, medical issues, um, violence against women. All these issues are out there. Or peace like myself and disarmament. All these issues are out there. It's a very exciting field. And please come out there. Make the world your arena. Sweden is needed out there. That's my message. Thank you.